to grow or not to grow? That's a question that we want to debate today. Once you start thinking about economic growth, it's hard to start to think about anything else because the arithmetic is so beautiful. The more output you generate, the more mouth you can feed, the more calories you can pay, the more technologies you develop. But what happens when the growth stops? Does the thinking stop? Do we really solve the big issue of climate change that our current generation is facing? Is it really the best option that we have in stock for decarbonizing our economies? Or do we just freeze all our problems? One third of the technologies needed for meeting the decarbonization goals of the Paris Agreement are not yet developed. Nicholas Stern coined climate change the biggest market failure of all time. So is the market best equipped to solve it or rather the state? We, the Decarb Policy Forum, a group of students hungry for new economic thinking. We want to explore the boldest ideas for solving the ever more pressing challenge of climate change. We're greatly honored that Otmar Edenhofer and Cameron Hepburn accepted our invitation for today's event. And thanks to Johanna Schiele for moderating our kickoff session. Thanks to Lukas Saleka, Christiane Heise, Sebastian Schonke, and Anna Goethe for shaping our program. You can find us online at decarb.world. Uh, because Paul Bruckmann and Mats Kröger have designed our website and Alexander Roth provide technical support. Tobias Menzel has led the collaboration with Impulse Labor, which make us look uh, presentable in the digital era. And Hannah Eger and Teresa Iglauer have developed a social media strategy. Thanks to the Herti Center for Sustainability and Maria Skoa for hosting us, which Oliver Runa kindly arranged. Last but not least, thanks to the German Foundation of Economies for supporting our initiative. So join us today for a glimpse into our collective future because everything is at stake for decarbonizing, for decarbonization in the upcoming decade. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. My name is Christian Flaxland. I'm a professor of sustainability at the Hertie School and director of the new Hertie School Center for Sustainability that went online actually only four days ago. Um, so we are uh, new, we have just started. Um, and I'm very excited about this event for three reasons. First of all, the topic, green growth, innovation, market incentives and investments for a green economy. These topics all go to the heart of the economics and social science of sustainability. Um, second, the speakers. I couldn't think of two better speakers on these topics. I'm very much looking forward to Cameron's and Otmar's inputs and the discussion. And third, um, for DCARB, well, organizing, self-organizing um, the seminar, self-organizing as an initiative, I think this, this polycentric uh, aspect of the sustainability transition is absolutely essential. And we're very happy, very glad uh, to partner with DCARB as the new head the Center for Sustainability. With that, uh, I'm very happy to hand over to Johanna and look forward to this event. Thank you. Hello everyone, a very warm welcome also from me. My name is Johanna Schiele and I am an MPP candidate at the Harvard Kennedy School. I have to admit I could not have been happier when Niels asked me to moderate today, as both Cameron Hepburn and Otmar Edenhofer have been my two professor heroes since I started studying. Not just for their research, but especially for their ability to publicly explain complex matters in an easy and digestible way. Making new economic thinking accessible to a wider audience is so important. And that's what's our goal in today's session. Many of the economic paradigms that we use today were born out of a time when a large fraction of the world was still extreme poverty, when the global average life expectancy was around 20 years less than today, and when Europe was in dire need of reconstruction after World War II. Assumptions that made reasonable sense in the 1950s are being challenged today. For example, the assumption that GDP growth is a good enough indicator for also growing human well-being. In today's session on green growth, we want to dive into the narrative of climate sensitive transformation and the research behind that. We will need investment and technological improvements to achieve net zero, but this growth based narrative um, often misses the importance of also consuming less and consuming smarter. Before we kick off, um, I have a couple of housekeeping rules. We'll have two short impulse presentations by Professor Edenhofer and Professor Hepburn, and then a moderated discussion followed by a Q&A. Please do ask your questions. We are really excited to hear from all of you. To do so, you can use the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar, and we ask you to please not use the chat, but the Q&A function. 
Once there's question in the Q&A box, you can rank them. So you say on which questions are being asked. You can also add your name and organization to the question if you want, but you don't have to. The event will be recorded and be made available after the fact. And now without further ado, let me introduce Professor Ottmar Edenhofer, who will deliver the first impulse presentation. Ottmar Edenhofer is a professor at the Technische Universität Berlin and widely considered to be one of the world's leading experts on the economics of climate change. He's the director and chief economist of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, as well as director of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. His research areas include energy economics, inequality research, economic growth, ability theory, and scientific policy advice. Professor Edenhofer, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Johanna. It's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to discuss these important issues with, with Cameron. Now, I will talk today about the inclusive wealth paradigm and uh, I consider this as a, as a new economic paradigm to think about the feasibility, the desirability and sustainability of our current economic system. And I would like to make four points. First, to kick off and to clarify, why do we discuss economic growth? What's the problem? And then I will present two fundamental paradigms the neoclassical environmental economics paradigm and what I call the inclusive wealth paradigm. And then I will make a few concluding remarks. So why do we discuss uh, economic growth and what's the reason for this? First of all, you can see that economic growth is a quite recent phenomenon in economic history. And we discuss it because it helped us to reduce poverty has increased inequality between countries over the last four decades considerably. It is associated with democracy and human rights. So the causal relationship might be open and political scientists are discussing this. These are the good sides and climate change is a, an important externality and Stern says it's the largest externality humankind has ever seen. Uh, human growth in, in the past few decades has also led to uh, inequality within countries, to a lot of insecurity, instability, and some people would also argue that the reason for populism lies in the uh, insecurity and, 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 and this underlying paradigm of, of economic growth. It is worthwhile to think carefully about uh, a few fundamental paradigms. And let me start with the uh, neoclassical environmental economics. And the, it is very important to understand that in this paradigm, nature is external to the economy. And, and let me explain how the usual climate economics models function. But first, we have the economic model. And the economy produces industrial CO2 emissions, cause burning uh, oil, coal, and gas. So it have some negative emission technologies, but this is nothing which is important currently. So the, the, the industrial uh, CO2 emissions uh, increase the radiation balance on Earth. Uh, so they impact uh, the radiative forcing and radiative forcing leads to uh, increasing global mean temperatures and then this produces the climate damages. But this is basically the interaction between the economy and the climate system. So the outcome is quite clear. So climate damages increasingly reduces GDP. A fraction of the GDP will be subtracted due to climate change. Emission reduction causes costs dependent on the technological change. But nevertheless, we can find an optimal pathway to some kind of intertemporal welfare. But the most important thing is that the decoupling between economic growth and emissions is guaranteed. This you can see here, you have an ongoing growth economic growth of GDP, but at the same time, you can reduce emissions. And the reduction of emission depends very much on, on your policy goal. Here you have the comparison between Nordhaus uh, three degree goal and the two degree goal, but the, the, there's an, an, an ongoing decoupling process. The ecological collapse is excluded by assumption and you have fundamentally two important policy. You need carbon prices 
and you need some kind of innovation policy. And if you want to tune the DICE model for a 1.2 degree target, this is also possible. Colleagues of mine have done this. Then you would see a sharper emission reduction, but also sharper increasing CO2 prices. So that's the fundamental characteristic of the DICE model. However, there is now an emerging new paradigm. And this new paradigm I call the um, inclusive wealth paradigm. And this paradigm has been articulated very extensively in the most recent Dasgupta review. Part of Dasgupta presented the economics of biodiversity, but this is much more than a book on the economics of biodiversity. Part of Dasgupta claims in this book that he has more to say about the relationship between nature and economic growth. And let me explain this a little bit in detail. The first important aspect here is that the economy, the economy is embedded in the biosphere. And uh, the economy might harvest from the biosphere and produce waste, but it is embedded. It provides a flow of resources and absorbs our waste. However, and this is quite important to understand, that the starting point to understand the interaction between nature and the economy starts with an impact inequality. What does this mean, the impact inequality? In a nutshell, it says that the demand of biospheric services is much higher than the supply. Or a little bit more in detail, there is the supply side, and the biosphere has a regeneration function, which depends on the stock of the biosphere, but there are a demand, an ecological footprint of human activity, and Y is divided by alpha, and alpha is an efficiency parameter with which the biosphere goods and services are converted into a GDP and extent to which the biosphere is transformed by our waste. And in this review, Pathetas Gupta argues that there's an inequality. So the demand is much higher than the supply. And here I would like to give you just a few uh, indications. The human appropriation of the production of biomass has been increased over the last few decades uh, in some hotspots. We have reduced the wilderness areas. We have changed the, the soil in organic carbon, which is an indicator for the, degrad for the degradation of land. Uh, and we have also created a loss of species richness around the globe. So these are a few indicators that the biosphere uh, regeneration function has been diminished significantly. So what does this mean for macroeconomic modeling? This means a lot. First, Padre Gupta has provided a, a function, a differential equation describing the evolution of the stock of the biosphere, dependent on the regeneration function, on our harvesting, and on our waste disposal. This is very important to understand and here, let me highlight the uh, two important differences between the more neoclassical environmental economics and the inclusive wealth paradigm. As I told you a minute ago, the neoclassical production function consists of capital, physical capital, human capital, and A as the total factor productivity, and it is impacted by a damage. So, which is subtract a fraction from the GDP. The decoupling of GDP and CO2 emissions is possible. Ecological collapse cannot happen. Now, Pathetas Gupta has included, has included and in, introduced in his model a new production function. It looks similar to the neoclassical production function, but it has a very important amendment. And the first important amendment is there is a stock of natural capital. You have physical capital, human capital, and you have the harvesting services from, from, from the biospheric uh, stock. Now, in this production function, part of the scoop that does not assume that the decoupling is possible uh, by definition, natural capital is essential and it has the possibility to collapse entirely. And he assumes that, or he claims, rightly so, that for this alpha parameter as an efficiency parameter for the waste disposal, there is 
a, a, a boundary condition. It might be larger than, than the current one, but it is definitely smaller than infinity. And this means that it implies that there is an absolute limit to the level of GDP. So Pavita Skupta brings on the table again the issue of the limits of GDP. Now, he embeds this production function in a much broader approach, which we could call the portfolio approach. He claims rightly there is capital, human capital, and natural capital. And the most important thing economists have to do, and ministers, prime ministers, have to do is managing the portfolio, the composition of the capital, the human capital, the physical capital, and the natural capital in an appropriate way. And he calls this the inclusive wealth paradigm because it includes not just physical capital, but it includes also human and natural capital. So this is the stock. From this stock, there flows a consumption flow. And this consumption flow in the future can only flow when the capital stocks are not deteriorated or depreciated. And therefore, he calls this in genuine savings. And in this uh, lecture, I use inclusive wealth and uh, genuine wealth in the chain. So there flows in the future also a level of consumption. And then you have a future value uh, welfare, and you have to compare the current welfare with the future welfare. And if welfare component is increasing so then you can say there is a sustainability in the system because the genuine wealth the inclusive wealth is increasing and not just gdp or consumption so this is the most important framework here for the sake of simplicity in my simulations i have assumed that uh, the economy is just interested in the utility function on consumption but even for consumption human capital, physical capital, and natural capital is essential. You can amount, you could amount this social welfare function with some kind of intrinsic value for nature and so on. But for the sake of simplicity, this is not really necessary. Now, what does it mean to invest in the biosphere or uh, to use the biosphere as a, as a global commons? First of all, uh, the biosphere is a global public good because it provides the services uh, to the whole economy. And there are two forms of investment into the biosphere asset. First, there's an active investment where you can restore uh, the biosphere like uh, uh, afforestation or passive investment, uh, which implies letting the biosphere systems to regenerate. So both aspects are uh, possible. And here you have the biospheric uh, regeneration and this is the ecological footprint when you basically use too much of the, uh, uh, the, the too much services from, from the biosphere. Of course, if you want to understand the biosphere, it is good to think about planetary boundaries. I don't want to go into the details of this planetary boundary that ranges from climate change to land system change, freshwater use, but there are at least some boundaries in the system and below this boundary, there's a risk that the whole sphere might collapse. I will not go into the mathematical details, but just for the economists, I would like hi to highlight uh, about the fundamental functions of the growth model. So this is the usual production function, and then you have the production and the expenditure equality. So there's an investment in total factor productivity, which is quite important. There's this regeneration function, where you have the regeneration rate and at the same time you have hosting and the waste disposal. Uh, then there are here some uh, planetary boundaries. Below the planetary boundaries, the regeneration rate of the biosphere is in danger and there are the usual investments into the capital stock. And there is an, also a population uh, 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 equation and this is a logistical population uh, growth equation. Now, let me highlight a little bit what are the outcomes of this model is. The first and the most important insight is that more and faster technological progress cannot deliver more GDP, but higher steady state levels. So total factor productivity does not allow an ongoing growth rate. It allows 
however, a higher steady state level. The whole economy in the end will converge in the long run to a steady state situation. And the, whole, the higher the, the, the total factor productivity is, the higher is the, the, the steady state level of the consumption. Another way to buy time is to increase the resource, the resource efficiency alpha Z. This leads also to a much higher long-term steady state level if you have technologies which can use uh, the waste in a much more efficient way, then you can have higher steady state levels. Reducing the population growth achieves also a higher steady state income per capita, but this is also an important aspect here. A lower population growth leads to higher steady state levels and can also reduce uh, the stress factors for the biosphere. Also, you can think about how to overuse the resources. You might subsidize the resource use as we are doing in the current situation. In the short run, then you can increase your GDP. In the long run, this will lead to lower uh, uh, steady state levels of, of consumption. And this is sometimes perceived by analysts that uh, what we are doing is we are increasing GDP in the short run and reducing even the GDP in the long run. But now you might say, okay, is this the typical limits to growth story? I wouldn't say it's the typical limits to growth story because we only talk about uh, the flow variable and the flow, flow variable is the GDP. But the question was from the beginning on, is GDP the appropriate indicator? And the answer is no. Because what we have to do is we have to think about the reasonable scarcities of natural capital and fiscal to analyze the shadow prices. And the overuse of resource degrades natural capital, which thus becomes more scarce. And higher scarcity of natural capital due to overuse leads to higher shadow prices. In the short run, resource overuse leads to higher investment in physical capital and to less scarcity. And if you calculate the shadow prices appropriately, what you can see is that in the long run, inclusive wealth can increase. It might be the case that the GDP falls, but GDP is not a good indicator for sustainability. A good indicator is the inclusive wealth, which consists of physical capital, human capital, and the natural capital. And in this case, the, natural, the inclusive wealth can increase over time. So in that sense, there might be an option uh, for uh, uh, towards the steady state that the GDP might decline temporarily, but nevertheless, we have then more human capital and we have more biophysical capital. What is the role of discounting? That's quite interesting. If we take into account future generations more seriously, we have a lower discount rate, and then we have also uh, a higher, uh, in the long run, a higher steady state level, but more importantly, that you can see here that the uh, inclusive wealth indicator increases significantly sharper compared to a situation where you have a higher uh, uh, pure time preference rate. And now it's quite interesting, the role of inequality aversion. It's not only about intergenerational justice, but intragenerational justice. And if you have a relatively high uh, inequality aversion, which means you want to increase the distribution across one generation, this uh, leads to a situation where the GDP increases and converges to a steady state level, but the inclusive wealth indicator declines. Why is this the case? A higher uh, uh, inequality aversion leads to lower investments in the capital stocks, human capital stock, physical capital stock and biophysical stock. And therefore, in the long run, this is not a sustainable pathway. It could become a sustainable pathway if you would also reduce the discount rate. So if you want to have intergenerational equality, you have to uh, also introduce intergenerational equality. Otherwise, you are not on a sustainable pathway. Now, let me summarize. We can buy time by reducing the population growth and by raising the efficiency parameters. However, no amount of technological progress can enable output to grow infinitely. 
but we can achieve higher steady state levels. For sooner or later, the biosphere will cross its safety soon. The idea of planetary boundaries is here one of the paradigms which puts flesh on these parameters. However, and this is important to emphasize, inclusive wealth can grow because biosphere is an asset. What we have to do is we need reasonable account prices. And the accounting price system is much more complicated than just about carbon pricing because the accounting scheme has to price human capital, produced capital, and physical capital equally according to the, re the, the, the real scarcities. Currently, and this is an empirical, uh, an empirical uh, 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 estimation from the Global Wealth uh, Report, it shows that we have increased produced capital. So we did uh, reasonable investments in human capital, but we observe a sharp decline in natural capital due to the fact that our accounting schemes are not uh, 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 appropriate. Now, the last thing what I would like to emphasize is that this type of models are necessary because we are in the middle of a debate where we are at risk. We might destroy the climate, we might uh, rescue the climate and destroy the biosphere. Think about the negative emissions debate. We need negative emissions, but all these emissions have some implications for the biosphere. For example, afforestation, biochar, and so on. And if we do afforestation, we might reduce emissions, but at the same time, we could increase the food prices, which might, which might impact, in particular, the poor people. So therefore, these models, which describe the biosphere much more comprehensively, are important. Otherwise, we would not choose a, a sustainable pathway. They are important research questions, which needs further enhancement, exploration of different social welfare functions, links between population and technology, in particular, introducing structural change from manufacturing sector to the service sector and modeling the policy interventions, which would provide a much richer uh, outlook. However, I think I can conclude. Inclusive wealth focuses on the portfolio management of assets, not on the growth of GDP. Neoclassical environmental economics is a special case of the inclusive wealth model. Emerging scarcities have to be reflected in the accounting prices, and structural change and product innovation has to be included because this might allow us to have another option to buy more time. And the climate biosphere trade-off calls for governing the global commons. So far, so good. Thanks you very, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your really interesting presentation. I have a whole bunch of questions right now, but uh, before we move on to Professor Hepburn, I would love to ask a question from the audience um, on the slides you just presented. So one attendee is asking, in the inclusive wealth indicator, what exactly does human capital include? I find including physical stock a bit disturbing if one does not account for the quality of the physical stock. We do not want an indicator simply saying that more physical stuff is good because it is not. They say that. One needs to account for what is being built, whether it is useful, whether it is built using sustainable production practices, etc. Is this considered in your indicators? Uh, I would say that by and large, uh, it, it is included. Uh, so you might say, okay, uh, we don't want less physical capital. Uh, so you can enhance, for example, the social welfare function where you are not just interested in consumption, but also in intrinsic values for the biosphere or uh, the quality of, of work and such kind of things. This can be done and the, the indicator can be enhanced by, by, by these dimensions. But for the time being, the only argument I would like to make is that whenever we think about growth, it's, it's not the, the, the proper paradigm. The most important thing here is to, to, to embed this in, in this kind of, of, a, of a, the portfolio approach. I think that's, that's quite convincing. Of course, the model I've had presented is an incredible, a simple model. Still, it has a lot of interesting and even quite complicated dynamical aspects. And I, I, I would like to emphasize, this is nothing which I would like to uh, present as a prediction. 
uh, even it's not 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 uh, it's it's just a a, a qualitative picture uh, how such a model looks like and how different the pathways can be to a steady state level. Great, and then we we have one other question from the audience, which is, um, in your opinion, does the does Gupta review indicate that the discipline of ecological economics may be more appro appropriate academic lens than environmental economics? It depends how you define ecological economics. I find this inclusive wealth paradigm or the in inclusive uh, inclusive wealth model much more convincing because it does not just focusing on, on a specific aspect on the environment, it has a much broader perspective on, on also on, on, on human capital. And I would say that's, that's a, a very appropriate uh, paradigm because it allows us also to think quite carefully about the limits and, and the boundary conditions for the regeneration of, of, of the biosphere. Interesting, thanks. Um, I'm sure we'll have time to discuss more of this later. But now I'm handing over to Professor Cameron Hepburn. Professor Hepburn is the director of the Oxford Smith School, as well as the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Smith School. He holds degrees in law and engineering, and doctorate in economics, and has published widely on energy resources and environmental challenges across these three disciplines. Professor Hepburn serves as the managing director of the Oxford Review of Economic Policy and has co-founded three successful businesses, Aurora Energy Research, Climate Bridge, and Vivid Economics. Cameron, over to you. Thanks, Johanna, for the warm uh, introduction. And thanks, Otmar, for really a wonderful talk, really spot on, fantastic. Uh, in some ways, it's made my job easy because you've done it all so clearly already. And in some ways, it's made it harder for me to say anything useful and additional but I will give it a go. Um, so what I wanted to do was just um, uh, consider some of the same questions as Otmar has considered from, a, from the perspective of where we are at the Smith School, which, uh, which is directed at Oxford, the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment. 90 of us working in these sorts of areas. We've got a new MSc coming uh, this year in these sorts of issues, uh, and we're focused on precisely the kind of questions here, net zero and sustainable development and meeting them simultaneously. So what I wanted to do with you just now was go through some of the economic history, uh, because these are not new questions. Are there limits to growth? You might think it extends back to the 70s and the you know, Nana Meadows and the oil shocks, but actually it goes back quite a long way. And then um, sometimes in debates about growth and degrowth, I think you can lose sight of the fact that we agree almost always those debating these issues on an awful lot. I thought it'd be worth emphasizing areas where there is strong evidence and agreement before moving into um, some reflections on the more conceptual and empirical questions of, of uh, sides of this question of whether we can keep growing. So let me start with the history. Um, a lot of good economic minds have thought about these questions. Can the economy keep growing forever? It's, it's actually, it's a very attractive question to think about, a fundamental and a big question. It's not surprising that, you know, multiple Nobel Prize winners uh, have turned their minds to it, greats like Keynes, but actually, you know, you go back a long way to John Stuart Mill and John, uh, John Hicks in the last century, and uh, the economists had something to say. So Mill thought that, um, a little bit like the Dusk Gupta Review, I've got a beastly copy of it, here, um, but, uh, thought that we did need to guide the economy to a stationary state or else an environmental collapse would result. Um, and Hicks kind of developed some of those ideas and thought, well, once you've got population under control, this kind of stationary state is a, a disaster. It's actually something that you wish to aim for. You want to um, stop growing. And, and Keynes thought, well, we'll solve the economic problem, of, you know, prosperity, material quality of living, then we'll be focused on thinking about non-economic purposes, art and so on. Actually, Mill reflected on the fact that humans, you know, once we're sufficiently prosperous, should be really thinking about the art of living, as he described it, rather than accruing more stuff, producing more things. And of course, as Otmar's just explained incredibly clearly, um, in, in the Dasgupta review, Path a big point about um, being clear that the economy is embedded within the biosphere, which of course it is, and can't be separated. And he comes to this conclusion as almost just set out that, that there are limits to growth. So 
that's some of the history. I'm going to take some of that on in a moment. But before I do, where do we agree? So firstly, I think there's no doubt that the economic model that we have at the moment has to change and change radically. We're in a mass extinction event. We're on track for mass climatic damage as well. You know, of course, some of those curves are starting to turn. There's reason to be optimistic, um, but the, the status quo is not okay. And to put it in the language uh, of Partha, the impact inequality, which is basically saying demand on the biosphere currently massively exceeds supply of the device biosphere. So it's, it's, a, it's inequality because demand is greater than supply. That needs to become an equality so that demand falls and supply increases uh, so that we're being sustainable. So that's all clear. Um, and in order to achieve that, we can't just keep growing the material flows through the economy. So these have to be dampened uh, and, and the, the growth stopped and we need to circularize those flows. So the materials we're taking from the biosphere are going back into the biosphere uh, in, in a way that is closed, the loop is closed. Uh, and, and the last point, a fundamental point, not my has set this up very nicely, is that the aim here isn't more GDP. I mean, GDP is a measure of the market-based value that is exchanged in the economy. It's, you know, it's got its flaws as a measure of that. Uh, it's certainly not a measure of welfare. And you might say what's well, a good proxy for um, welfare in very poor countries, perhaps, because more stuff equals less poverty. Uh, but it's certainly not a good proxy for welfare in developed economies. So all of that, I think, can be taken as red. And for me, the tough question is, is the end to GDP growth necessary, feasible, or desirable to meet our environmental objectives? And so I'm going to explore the theory and the, some of the empirics around that in just a minute. But before I do, I just want to firmly agree that the inclusive wealth paradigm is the right paradigm here. And I have a, a book with Kirk Hamilton. Here it is on the topic. Uh, and the UN and the World Bank has done great work here. And, and the reason I think this is a step in the right direction is that it's actually a pragmatic and achievable step. You're already starting to get countries around the world develop inclusive wealth accounts. You know, we're not there yet, uh, but the theory is actually um, not horrifically complex, I would say. The practice is tricky, to be fair, uh, but we're on the way there. And I think the, the sooner we get um, chancellors, presidents, prime ministers being challenged about the wealth numbers for their country rather than the GDP numbers of their country. Um, you know, we will be in, in better, a better place then. So um, let me just move to some of the core concepts. So like Otmar, like Partha, I completely agree that the economy is embedded in society, which is embedded in the biosphere. All that's understood. But I'd say that there is, in addition, an awful lot of it highly ordered incoming energy from the sun, uh, not to mention the moon and so on, into that biosphere. Uh, that means that this is not a completely closed system. If you're thinking about, if you're, if you're an engineer or a physicist thinking about the laws of thermodynamics here, it's not a closed system. And while it is closed basically to matter, you know, we lose a bit of helium, but basically it's a closed system for matter. It's not um, completely closed to energy. And what that means is that um, we do need to put bounds, I mean, we have no choice. There will be bounds placed on the material throughput of the economy precisely because it's embedded in these physical ecosystems and the incoming solar energy doesn't change those bounds. Now you can have a debate about how close we are to the bounds on the material throughput of the economy. Um, you know, Partha's review suggests very close. There are other ways of looking at this that suggest you know we maybe have a bit of time. But either way, I don't think this is up for discussion. We're, we're, we've got a problem here in due course uh, that we need to solve. I think the key point I would like to make and um, grapple with a little bit more is that. While there are bounds on the material side of things, I am not yet convinced that there is any bound on the ability of humans to have ideas. And the way in which we can reconfigure matter using this highly ordered incoming energy to create value, I suspect is pretty close to limitless. Now you might say pretty close to limitless is not the same as limitless and, and as a, a theoretician, I these distinctions. 
but as a practical matter, if, if we've got another, you know, um, 100,000 years worth of growth ahead of us, uh, or, or even 1,000 years, frankly, I think you know, that's probably enough. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, if you think about how much value we get out of units of matter, uh, go back a couple of hundred years and, and an atom of silicon lying around as silicon dioxide on a beach, it's not particularly valuable to anybody. You come forward to the 20th century and you're using silicon and silicon chips and semiconductors, that small, tiny, tiny amount of matter is suddenly worth an awful lot. And why? Well, it's because the amount of intelligence we've imbued into that tiny chip that is powering your camera, your computer, your video, et cetera, all the rest of it. Um, you know, we move forwards and you're thinking about quantum computing. There are a bunch of startups on this in Oxford, and I've invested in one, where it's not just the atom that we're generating value from, it's the spin of electrons. Like, these are minusculely small compared to the atom, right? And, and humans are able to now generate highly valuable information from some stru such structures. Now, you know, I'm not saying we're going further and further down to bosons and so on, and nor am I denying the fact that our activities, of course, are embedded physically in nature. But I guess for me, uh, the big question is to what degree can we keep, you know, so take it as read that we're gonna close these physical systems, we're gonna bound the throughput of material uh, and growth there completely stops. But if we keep having ideas that keep generating more value from the material world in which we are embedded, is it not possible that the value that we exchange with each other, which would be measured GDP, uh, could rise? So for me, the solution to many of our problems is not to deny the behavioral dimensions, which are very, very important, nor to deny that we need to think about our consumption models and whether we are consuming what we really need or whether we're getting well ahead of us. But the question here is we need more mind and less matter. And I've been saying this for years now because it still tickles me years later. But when I just had this thought, I thought that's a great line, more mind, less matter. I'll put it into Google and see what comes up, you know, see if I could catch um, it as a kind of catchphrase. And what I got was, uh, do you mean more mindless matter? Of course, that is the opposite of what we're talking about here. Anyway, right, so where are we on, the, so much for the concepts, on the empirics, uh, well, we're not really winning, are we? Whether you look at CO2 emissions or whether you look at biodiversity loss uh, against any of these economic measures, we are struggling to do both at once. So, so even if you know maybe there is there is a little opening in theory for us to, um, uh, uh, well, it's more than a little opening. It's very important possibility. So far in practice, we're not winning. And if you have a look at the environmental SDGs and the SDGs in general, from this starting point today, is a lovely um, animation of this online from uh, uh, Ola Rosling and the Gapminder Foundation then you know, many of the environmental kind of SDGs uh, action is patchy uh, and we're not on track. So you know, we're, we're not winning on the environmental dimension. Now that doesn't mean in theory that we couldn't, it just means that we're not, the model that we're working on at the moment doesn't, isn't working for us. Now, are we running out of materials? That is a different question. Uh, I'm gonna quickly address that now. How many years do we think we've got left of copper? say, ask yourself the question. One, two, 10, 100, 1,000? Well, it turns out current rates of production, it's, you know, 30, 40-ish years. And you might think, well, that's, that's fairly problematic. We're going to run out of copper in 2050. Um, clearly, there are major limits to growth here. But if you go back in time and you have a look at key minerals and when you would expect them to be uh, exhausted, you can make predictions in given years. So let's assume we make a prediction in 1960 here. As to when we're going to run out of a particular mineral, you might predict it's going to run out in 2020, back in 1960, so it gives you 60 years left. If you make predictions like this, and if the slope of the predictions is, is going down, that would mean that we've got a serious problem. Not only are we wrong with our predictions, as time moves into the future, our predictions are such that we've got less of the minerals available, we're going to run out earlier, uh, we're clearly in trouble. If you had a flat line like this, it would mean that your predictions are at least but they don't change. You, you thought you were going to run out in 2030 and 1960, and in 2010, you still think you're going to run out in 2030.
But if your predictions look like this as a function of when the predictions were made, as each year passes, you predict you've got an extra year worth of minerals, then you might think that for the moment all fairly well. Now, if you take this sort of model to the data, here are 10 of the most significant minerals. And it turns out that you know, in 1960, you would have thought you're running out of them in 2000 or 1980, but time passes. It turns out we've got more, we find more, we innovate, we use um, the more efficiently, we get more value per unit of the mineral, et cetera. Uh, and basically the economic system thus far is working to suggest that we don't have some sort of immediate scarcity in our mineral resources. And the reason is that this part of the economy has prices in it. And those prices incentivize efficiency and innovation and looking for more of it and demand restraint because if the price is rising, you use less or you substitute to different minerals. So you go from copper to fiber optics, which actually happens to be better as well. So there, there is reason to think that once we get these, the, the accounting prices that Otmar mentions into place, then we might not be at such a tight uh, constraint on our, um, on our limits. Uh, and you know the, the Ehrlich Simon bet, which Simon won, uh, it was the famous bet, look it up, I don't know it. Um, he would have lost at a different period, but the point of this is to show that actually, I'm not sure these kind of bets are very helpful. You need to really step back out and have a think and look at the data over very long periods. Uh, you know, and, and the, the 60 year period I just showed you is not, still not really long enough to tell you whether we're running out, it tells you that we're not running out right now. Of course, the big problem is that we are stuffing up our renewable natural capital. Um, part of the reason is that it isn't priced anywhere near as well as the exhaustible natural capital is priced. And of course, unless we change our economic model, the pressure on the biosphere is only going to increase. If you think that we're now at almost eight, or we are, uh, yeah, eight billion people, 10, 15,000 uh, US uh, dollars of GDP per capita. You fast forward to 2050, and you're looking at a kind of three-fold three increase in pressure on the biosphere if we don't change the model. So that takes me back to the where do we agree? Uh, clearly, major changes are required. So let, let me wrap up. Economists have been thinking about the limits to growth for a very long time. And whether you think there are kind of very long-run limits or not, uh, I, I think it's personally a very, very interesting theoretical question. I, I don't think it's completely irrelevant either to how we behave today, but it may not be that relevant to what we do right now in the sense that once you've accepted the fact that the growth model needs to change radically and we need to go towards inclusive wealth, and we need to get these prices right, but also go beyond uh, price interventions, um, then actually the debates about what happens in a thousand or 10,000 years uh, may not lead to different policy prescriptions for what to do right now. But you know, I'm interested in the theory too. And I guess notwithstanding the dust sculpture review and, um, uh, and the idea that Alfred, uh, as Partha puts it, shouldn't be assumed to be able to increase indefinitely. He's right about that. You shouldn't assume that. Equally, I'm not sure we can just assume that it can't increase, uh, that, that we can't extract or produce more value to from the same underlying atomic real basis on Earth, especially given that we've got these uh, incoming flows of highly ordered energy to use. Anyway, theory aside, in practice, there's absolutely no compelling evidence that we're doing this yet. Uh, and clearly what we need to do is to change the growth model, change the model, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't deliver uh, extreme uh, harm to many people around the world. You see what happens when you have a recession. That is what zero growth means, guys. And in a recession, people kill themselves, people lose their jobs, there's, there's uh, extreme levels of unhappiness. So uh, it's managing these kind of twin requirements that we, that we have to do, and it's tricky, uh, but it's a good discussion. And Otmar, you just, you started this off so nicely with your presentation. Uh, I haven't quite come up to your there, but I look forward to the discussion uh, with you and everybody else shortly. Thank you. Thank you so much, both Cameron and Otmar. Um, there's so much to touch on here, but it seems like innovation and technical development really seem to be a, an important aspect but of both of your presentations, so maybe we start here. 
Um, Cameron, you wrote a paper in 2012 that shows even if we held per capita GDP constant, so if there was no per capita growth at all, annual improvements of 6% in carbon intensity would still be needed um, to have a chance of reaching the Paris goals. So given that most of our models about technological improvement are based on growth, learning by doing, for example, um, for example, the massive drop in the cost of renewables, can a stagnant economy deliver the technological innovation that is required to achieve our carbon intensity improvements at all? Question to both of you. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Do we, I mean, I think um, getting out of the theoretician mindset and, and into the practical world, if, if we're in recession for the next 10 years, what I think you tend to find is that people focused in on, you know, their, their survival, what to them, they, you know, we've just seen with the COVID pandemic, there's a massive pumping up of the economy. We, we did a lot of work trying to make it just really obvious how sensible it would be to do that while also reshaping the economy, but we thus far haven't done that. I think it's very difficult to put lots of surplus capital into clean ideas when, when you're in the middle of a recession. Now, I think to be fair, the degrowth advocates aren't adv advocating for you know, an immediate, nasty, protracted recession. Well, I think perhaps some of them might be, but I think most of the sensible ones are saying, look, we just need to get a glide path here if growth starts to turn down and we gradually manage our way into a different sort of economic structure, uh, which you know, could potentially make some sense. But, but uh, personally, I think having people feeling comfortable, happy, satisfied with lots of surplus allows you to invest information that, that we need. Yeah, th th thanks, Cameron. First of all, thanks. It was very, very stimulating. Um, I would like to respond uh, in, 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 in two ways. The first one is on, on your intellectual economy. Um, of course, from my point of view, uh, technological progress is absolutely essential. And I agree fully with what uh, Cameron said. Even if we would stabilize GDP per capita, most of the um, of the contribution to the emission reduction has to come from from technological change but i think in our economic models we we have to think much more carefully about the direction of technological change technological change is can be that in this case total factor productivity Most growth economists are focusing on total factor productivity but that's not good enough because this would only deliver a level of, 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 of a stationary state. However, we have to think about the alpha Z. And uh, admittedly, in, in my simple simulation, uh, I, I, I changed alpha Z uh, exogenously. It would be very, very important to have a model where we could basically invest in, 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 this, in this efficiency parameter. And, and the second aspect here is, so we should not only talk about total factor, and this efficiency parameters, we should have in mind a third dimension. And this is, I only touched this in my presentation very uh, quickly, and this is product innovation. So the, the, the model, which uh, I basically have amended a bit from and, and borrowed from, from Partha, it's, it's a, a one product model. We have one product and you try to, to produce this one product with less energy and, and less material. But in reality, we are producing a multitude of products. We have product innovation. And this product innovation could come with less waste, with less energy. And, and, and the space in the end could be a space where we just exchange educational services without any waste or very, very limited waste. And this would enhance, so to say, our, our human well-being in, 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 in the long run. My feeling is that in these models, we will only get a, real, a more realistic sense. So what's the potential of decoupling when also introduce product innovation because this is at the core of the intellectual economy uh, Cameron has has added here. So in that sense, I, I I would say we don't know the theoretical limits. From practical terms, what we have to do is, and I think we can we can find a lot of agreement across the the, the, the different camps. We need reasonable pricing schemes which at least include the most pressing scarcities. Uh, we are facing now.
I think we have a question from the participants exactly on that point, um, including pricing. I can't find it right now, but I think I remember. So one participant asked um, why we are not starting to include the social cost of carbon, at least in the public sector now, like what are we waiting for? Clearly in the private sector, we need politics to agree to um, have a carbon price. We need to get it through parliaments and so on. But why don't we include the real social cost of carbon and social costs of negative externalities in the public sector right now? No, uh, 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 the way to start the answer is to say that actually we, we do in part uh, in some countries, in some sectors, um, to some degree. But I guess the thrust of the question is correct, which is that we don't do it nearly enough. We don't do it broadly enough. And the car carbon prices that we have are not high enough. OK, and then the question is, why not? And the answer to that um, is really largely, I think, around the political economy. Um, and you know, there, there are many, many interests that don't want a carbon price in place. Or and, and where we have got carbon prices in place, it's often only because those interests have been bought off or compensated in some fashion. Uh, you know, the EU ETS is perhaps a prime example. I'm not necessarily suggesting it's a bad thing to uh, compensate those who lose. Uh, on a pragmatic basis, on an on a ethical basis, perhaps you would have a different discussion. But, but if um, thinking clearly about inframarginal transfers that happen when you price carbon and making some uh, adjustment for that, if that allows you to then get prices at the margin, then that's something that I'm in favor of. Uh, as to the idea that we're doing it more in the private sector, um, you, know, you do have shadow costs being applied by different companies, and that's welcome. Having said that, I think the thing that really matters is that you get actual prices being paid into exchequers. Um, and you know, that takes us back to where I started, that we, that we still don't have enough of that. And that requires government and requires um, the, the politics to be overcome. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. So be, being involved in the in over the last uh, two years in the German carbon reform, I have to admit uh, I'm not hundred percent sure what's the reason why why this simple idea uh, is not applied sufficiently. Uh, I can offer two reasons. First, um, politicians are mainly interested and concerned about distributional issues. So you can hardly know politician convince if you say something is more efficient. Uh, so you, you have to resolve, before you talk about efficiency, you have to resolve the distribution of issues. And the second aspect is there are a lot of, of confusion around this idea of the carbon pricing, because most people, uh, in, in particular more in the, in the in, in, the, in the more progressive spectrum of our societies believe that carbon pricing is a, a market-based instrument, that the, the prices emerges from some kind of market forces. But the contrary is true. You need a very strong state to impose either a quantity target or a price on, 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 on the system. And therefore, though this, uh, this, this issue of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, market-based instruments, I do not like because they are market-based in the sense that policymakers have to create an own market, a new market. But it is a politically created market. It is not something that emerges from the market. And, and, and that's, that seems to me that leads to a lot of confusion and, and, and misunderstanding. And we as economists, we have to do a much better job because we have to take the distribution concerns of policymakers much more seriously. And one, one argument which I find sometimes convinces policies is that all other costs, subsidies, uh, performance standards have also costs. But in contrast to carbon pricing, and uh, they, you have no revenues to, to compensate the losers and, and, and the low income households. So uh, a, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of more work has to be done uh, to, 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 to push this idea in the public corner. Maybe this brings us back to the GDP question again as well, because if we were looking at something other than GDP, maybe governments would also have, also have a larger appetite to implement these instruments. So 
given that both of you seem to agree pretty much that GDP is not the ideal indicator, or as Cameron said, that we need to get over our GDP obsession, how do we actually do that? How do we get policymakers, politicians, and central banks to change the most fundamental accounting parameter that they currently use? There's, there's a nice um, uh, piece by Diane Coyle, actually, uh, seeking to answer that question um, in, uh, in this book with, with Kirk called The Political Economy of National Statistics. You might have thought that that made for super exciting reading, but actually it is properly good. I, I recommend it to all of you out there. She's, she's kind of answering that question. How do we actually get people to be, to be demanding these statistics and have governments to be supplying them? Because if we get these statistics and an awful lot of other things about how we behave and the decisions we make, changes. I have to say, I never would have thought 10 years ago that, that, or, or 20 years ago that I would have got excited about the political economy of national statistics, but it's a, it's a great chat. One aspect that I would like to add here is we, we are talking about pricing in the end. We want to, to change investment behavior, right? So it's an intertemporal issue. We want to change investment behavior. And if you look, so and how misleading statistics can be, for example, if you impose a price on our system, so you have some dip in the GDP, not a strong one, but a, a, a dip in the, in the GDP, it comes across as costs. The same is true for the healthcare system. If you, in, in, in our statistics, healthcare is a, is, is a macroeconomic cost. So most people ignore that, that investment in healthcare can in, enhance human capital, even pure productivity. So, and, and in that sense, what is, a, what is a cost and what is an investment? So this, this seems to me is quite important. And, and I think we have to frame the whole thing that the state, the power of the state, should be used to also to incentivize the, the, the right investments, but also the right the private investments. And in, in the end, what we are talking about when we are talking about this inclusive wealth paradigm and, and, and this portfolio approach, this is, this is not to put a burden on people, but it is really what economists should do, enhancing wealth. But, but, but the wealth indicator has to be the right one. And, and, and if we promote and enhance inclusive wealth, that's a good thing. And, and if you do the accounting system in, a, in an inappropriate way, so some things appear as costs, which are in the end not costs, but the long-term benefits. So this nicely ties in with another question from the audience um, is asking, how can we actually measure human and natural capital? And is it maybe also a reason for not doing it that it's very hard? Um, well, the the measurement of they're both tricky. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's no two ways about it. Um, but actually, you know what, measuring GDP is tricky as well. And because just we we've been using it for so long that we kind of assume that it's something solid and permanent and reliable. But actually, it's 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 you know. One way of be putting it is a bit dodgy itself, actually measuring the value of all of the different amounts of machines and physical capital and so on in the economy is tricky as well. So how do we do it? Well, the natural capital side of things we do fairly badly. Um, you you can kind of add up all the minerals and an awful lot of the natural capital. Many of you probably wouldn't believe is actually coal, oil, and gas assets that that comes under natural capital because it's resources, but also minerals and so on. Uh, and you know, you work out how much you got, how much each unit is worth, and roughly speaking, you can multiply them together. Uh, now that massively underestimates things when you've got a, a, a rapid downward sloping demand curve, right? Because because you're just measuring the value of what you've got at the margin, not not uh, how much more it might be worth as you increasingly find that it's getting scarce. The value of your ecosystems. Um, is, is in principle in their in, in limited forms in some countries' accounts. Although again, um, I'm pretty sure that you would find that it was an underestimate of true uh, valuation. So we don't do brilliantly on natural capital, but it's better to it's better to make a start and to do it shoddily, I think, than to not do it at all. So the countries that are not doing it, I wouldn't get stuck into them and say, you know, 
you're doing it badly. I'd say, well done for having a first go. Now let's try and make it better. On human capital, it's a bit, it's also, um, you can approach this by thinking about the, um, the, the expected earnings of a person over their lifetime and effectively capitalize the future stream of um, wage-based income for a person, but that, you know, uh, that, that likely underestimates the value of the capital of a human. The other thing to, to clear at this point is that just because you're putting prices on things doesn't mean that you're saying that's the only way in which we value them or, or the only values that are attached to them. What we're saying is that uh, in terms of helping to make allocation decisions in a national finance ministry, um, that this is a useful number to help us make those kind of decisions. It's not saying we value a human at X or we value a tree at Y. But so, yeah, so we, we do have a go at this. It's imperfect, but it's better that we keep trying and we keep doing it better. I have nothing to add, I fully agree. Great, then we continue with a question from Cornelia Auer, who is um, also at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change Impacts. Cornelia is asking, until we figured out new theories um, and strategies, would a clear message to policymakers on reducing the discount rate right now be an obvious no regret choice that we can do? And her point is that reducing the uh, discount rate would obviously address intergenerational equality it would shift the focus away from overconsumption to investment, and it would also help with intragenerational equality, um, according to experiments at PIC. Yeah, so I I, I would agree, but but uh, a reduced discount rate is 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 not an easy task, right, in a society. So it's you cannot say reduce it, but the the way you can do it is then you can basically incentivize uh, in, in investments. And, um, and, and, and with such an accounting scheme, which would be ideally in place, you could give the, the investments a much better direction. I'm a little bit concerned, to, to be honest, about this current recovery package around the globe after the corona crisis. Everybody is applauding politicians who spend money for, for green investments, but I do not understand most of the time. And Cameron has, has done a, a very interesting study on this if this recovery investments are really channeled to more green investments. And therefore I also see uh, such an accounting scheme, but in particular pricing scheme, which make very, very clear uh, that where, where is the, the, the social return on investment here. So in, in that sense, um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. And uh, in, the, in enhancing the intergener intergenerational justice is, is an important aspect. But for doing this, and for the policymakers, you need you need at least, as the very very minimum, a reasonable kind of stock account. So Germany, for example, has no stock account. We, we don't know what the value of, of our of our public uh, of, of our public capital. We, we have no idea what what is the value of our forests. So if if we would do basically price uh, CO two outside the energy system. We would, we would, uh, that this would be increase the value of the forests tremendously, but nobody would recognize this. And now in, in German, the forests are dying. We have serious problems with our forests. And this is bad for Germans because Germans like the forests. But, but, but this was basically completely ignored over the last few decades. So what we would need is at least a, a better understanding of, of, of our stock accounts. And this is also, this also applies to, uh, to other countries. And based on this, you could come up with much more reasonable pricing schemes. There's a, a lot of work to, ahead of us. Uh, and, and there's, so you need the tax system from my point of view to reduce the, 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 the social discount rate. This cannot be uh, simply announced. So this, is, this has to be incorporated in some kind of, of tax policies. I agree. I, I think it's, in some ways, it's kind of criminal that we pretend to run our nation states without a set of accounts, national accounts, stock accounts. Um, you, you would, it would, in fact, be criminal to run a company without having a balance sheet. Yes, we do with our countries. And I think making that point loudly and clearly, why, why is it okay to run an entire country without knowing what our assets are and our liabilities? But it's criminal to be a director of a company if you can't tell 
the authorities what, what's on your balance sheet, what, what, what your assets and your liabilities are. It's extraordinary. Um, can I go back to the question of discount rate? Um, it's worth being, being very careful about, and I, and I say, what I'm about to say, I say as, as someone who helped the UK government to think through its process in 2002-03 to, to lowering its social discount rate. But, but if you reduce the discount rate, it doesn't automatically mean that things get greener. What, what it means is that you shift the balance between consumption now, the present, and investment for the future. Now, if that means that you invest an awful lot of money in roads and coal-fired power plants and smoking facilities, then lowering the discount rate uh, can be bad for the environment. I'm not saying it is bad for the environment. I'm just saying that actually um, it's not automatically good. So I guess we get back to something Otmar said earlier, which is about really understanding the direction of technical change he was referring to earlier, but also the direction of investment. And a low discount rate is good if you've got all your prices right and so that your capital is being directed to the sorts of things that are prospering, which happen to be green. So uh, just pump, and I agree with everything Otmar said, it's not, not easy to just um, turn down the discount rate. Mind you, it's worth, worth bearing in mind that we do have very, very low interest rates right now across the economy. So in principle, uh, globally, so in principle, there should be a lot of future focused activity going on. I'm not sure that we're actually getting that in practice because there are a bunch of other macro issues going on. But um, so uh, Cornelia, your question is, um, is particularly, it's trickier than it may seem. I, I agree, but I would like to add one, one aspect here. You are right, Cameron, that you are living in a, in a low interest rate environment, but, but this is in particular true for, for Europe. Uh, if you go to the developing countries and look at the capital costs, the capital costs are significant, quite high. And the increase of the capital costs in the developing countries has almost destroyed uh, the technological progress we made in the renewable energy sector. So the high capital costs for Bangladesh make it easier to invest in coal than in, in, into, into solar PV or PV or wind. And in that sense, I would say what we should do from my point of view, we should talk about the global coal phase out, in particular in Southeast Asia, because this is very, very important. And this is important ahead of, of the Glasgow COP. The Glasgow COP. And, and I think what, what, what could be done is to reduce the discount rates in, in such countries that we, which means Europe, we could provide investment funds subsidizing either the interest rates or the upfront investment costs for those. And in exchange, they should introduce reasonable pricing schemes. So th this, this kind of, 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 um, of financing transition seems to me quite, uh, quite natural. One aspect I would like to, to emphasize because I was very intrigued by Cameron's comment uh, uh, and said it's, it's almost criminal not to have an, an, an accounting scheme. And, and this is something which I would really emphasize here. The GDP idea has been introduced for governments because they want to have an indicator for the level of production. This was due to the, the, the Keynesian uh, revolution. And for that, it was OK. But it was never meant to be an indicator for, for, for the welfare of a country. And we miss this aspect for a reasonable accounting schemes. And this is, a, this is not just a technical issue. It's a deeply more issue. It is, it is a criminal act to destroy assets for a company. But it is completely OK to do this for a government. And this has to be changed uh, uh, very rapidly. I would love to ask more questions. And there's also plenty more questions from the audience. Um, I'm afraid we might have to wrap it up here. So I really want to thank both of you, give you the time if you want to have a closing remark. Um, so we can do that. And then I'm going to give a look out on the next events. Uh, Professor Edenhofer, don't you go first. No, I, I, I want to, to, to thank this initiative. I want to thank Cameron. It was great to discuss these issues. And I, I think we have a lot of common ground on this inclusive wealth idea. I think really the biosphere issue and the, the, the inequality uh, the inequality between demand and, and supply from the biosphere is a, is a very pressing issue. And we should not forget this important aspect uh, uh, uh,
to embed this in climate policy. And additionally, I would say uh, it, is, it is now very, very important to develop new macroeconomic models a, a, along these lines. Uh, for example, the interaction between population and technology seems to me is a, a very important aspect introducing in such kind of models product innovation. I, I think we have to work as economists really, not just on the accounting system, that's also important. This is important for the government, but we should really work on, on a new type of macroeconomic models, which provide us the guidance uh, for the sustainable uh, pathways. Well said. Uh, uh, it was a real pleasure, uh, the discussion, and thanks, thanks to the organizers. Thanks for, to Johanna for moderating so nicely. And in terms of final substantive remarks, I think, yeah, the, 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 the theoretical questions about can we grow forever uh, are very interesting. I find them fascinating. Uh, but, and there, there's a question from Sebastian actually about whether you're, uh, you can grow forever to a steady state that's increasing. And perhaps if you're asymptotically growing at slower and slower, slower rates, you're still growing forever, but you're just not growing to infinity. So those sorts of theoretical questions are interesting. I think in terms of, you know, properly avoiding environmental collapse today, they may not have too much bearing on what we need to do. You know, we know what we need to do which is significantly more investment in green directed uh, technological change uh, and, in, and investment in green activities, significantly reduced slash zero investment in new fossil fuel infrastructure at this point. It's too late to be adding new fossil fuel infrastructure. We need things like Stanford University has just announced net zero by 2035 with net biodiversity gain by 2035. We need those biodiversity sorts of and more um, targets for the protection of nature coming into the conversation too, because of course it is theoretically possible that you get to net zero emissions by completely wiping out uh, the habitats that actually we need to survive upon, um, to survive with. And so I think th these elements have to come together. Pricing is obviously the other key one. None of it's easy. Uh, I pasted in the chat uh, a paper that Otmar and I and others co-authored about how to try to get through some of these practical problems of getting pricing to happen. Uh, but yeah, there's an awful lot of work for us to do. If you're listening and interested in these questions and you've got a good brain, then we need you. So um, stay engaged and stay in touch. Thanks. Thank you both so much for your time and for your insights today. Um, today's recording will be posted on our website, dcarb.world. And also here comes a shameless plug for our next event. On June 15th, we will be talking to Professor Tim Jackson, Dr. Catherine Trabach, and Professor Susan Paulson about post-growth. And the registration link can be found in the chat now. And very finally, in the name of the organizing team, including Nils Handler, Oliver Runau, Lukas Aleka, Maria Skora, and many others, I would also like to thank the event partners for their support. This is the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change the Zoe Institute for Future Fit Economics, the Berlin Herty School Center for Sustainability, and the Think Lab of the German Economy Foundation. Thank you all for attending and have a lovely week. <laughs>